I'm going to get the session started right away because it is chock full of incredible information. And last time we went like right up to the hour because it was just so compelling. And hopefully we can get some more time to ask questions if I don't, you know, mess around too much at the beginning of this call. So I will promptly stop and pass it over to my good friend, Chris Dopich, who is a super duper mega awesome engineer man at Zapier with a heart of gold. And he's here today to tell us about how to rock the technical interview. So Chris, without further ado, on to you, my friend. Awesome. Thanks for the intro, Stacey. Appreciate it. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, like Stacey mentioned, my name is Chris. Um, I'm located here in Portland, Oregon. And today we're going to be chatting about uh, how to do technical interviews. So let me get my screen share going here and we will dig into these slides. Okay, cool. You should be able to see a presentation. Yes. Lovely. Okay. Cool. So let's get into it. Uh, first, let's go over the agenda for the talk today. Uh, so first, we'll be establishing, you know, what exactly do I mean by a technical interview and just kind of defining what that looks like. Then we're going to dig into the structure and typical schedule that you'll see for these interviews and give you a little bit of information about what to expect there. Uh, we'll do some tips on making a good first impression and how to really present the best side of yourself for the interview. And then in number four, we'll really dig into the, the core topic at hand today, which is how to really rock that technical interview, how to approach the problems, how to analyze things, how to work through the problem out loud and all that good stuff. Then after that, we'll also touch on how uh, not only is the technical interview a problem solving thing, but it's also a behavioral interview as well it, uh, that kind of goes on at the same time. And we'll talk about some tips uh, around how you can approach that piece of it as well. And then lastly, we'll also talk about some ways that you can interview the company that's interviewing you too, because every interview is a two way street. Cool. So let's dive into what exactly is meant by a technical interview. So a technical interview is an interview format where there are one or more interviewers assigned to assess your coding and your problem solving abilities. In these kinds of exercises, you'll usually be given one or more coding problems that you need to solve with code or sometimes pseudocode, depending on the interview. Uh, for example, a really common question that many of you may be familiar with, um, but if not, this is kind of like the classic uh, code interview question is FizzBuzz, uh, which is when you uh, print integers one to n, uh, n meaning like up to some number of integers, uh, but print the string fizz if the integer is divisible by three, buzz if it's divisible by five, or fizz buzz if it's divisible by both three and five. So pretty simple solution, um, but that kind of gives you an a idea of the gist of what these are gonna be like. They're gonna be kind of like con slightly contrived uh, questions a lot of the time with uh, clearly bounded inputs and expected outputs. Now the interviewers who are interviewing you are gonna be trained to assess uh, primarily how you solve the problem, like what uh, coding techniques do you use? What data structures do you choose to use? What algorithms, et cetera. But they're also gonna be looking at how you communicate your thoughts. Uh, they're gonna be you know, looking at what kind of questions that you're asking and how you're approaching a problem. And they're also gonna be assessing really how you behave under pressure um, because, you know. It's, it's no joke, these, uh, these questions can be tough, right? It's definitely a, a pressurized situation. Um, and nobody likes to just kind of sit down and, and have you know, random pop quiz questions thrown at them in a room. Um, but at the same time, you know, it allows interviewers to kind of create this sort of artificial situation where they can hopefully get some insight into how you work, especially how you work under pressure. So uh, you'll see some common interview formats for technical interviews. Uh, largely along these three lines. So uh, the sort of oldest school format is uh, just using a straight up whiteboard. Um, this might actually be like a physical whiteboard, um, which I guess probably not a lot of companies are doing, you know, right now with the pandemic, but that used to be a thing that people would do. Um, although if you're gonna be remote, you, you also just might not actually have a physical whiteboard. So a lot of times people will use like Google Docs or something similar. And for just a whiteboarding exercise, um, usually it's really like your pseudocode and sort of your approach to the algorithm that's really the more important part than the syntax and whether it would actually run. Um, and it's really more just focused on your problem solving abilities, your thought process. And whenever you test out your algorithm, it's just gonna be like stepping through it uh, and sort of mentally executing the, um, 
uh, the lines of code in your head and keeping track of what the variables would be rather than actually running it. Now contrast that to another style, which is the full IDE support. Um, so this is, as you might expect, a situation where you get the full benefit of some kind of integrated development environment. Um, frequently, these are run in something like CoderPad or some other kind of online shared editing experience. Uh, you might be familiar with some of these uh, already. Um, and for these, it's gonna matter more if you can get the code actually working in the environment. Um, since you are given the benefit of the IDE, it's gonna help give you sort of the um, advantages that it normally does when you're coding, right? Like it's gonna give you nice syntax highlighting, it's gonna give you autocomplete, it's gonna give you the red squigglies if you do something wrong, right? So um, there's a little bit higher of an expectation that you know by the end of it, it should probably ideally actually run. Um, and because you're using a computer, right? Like you'll actually have the ability to run your code and uh, see if it outputs the correct thing. And if not, uh, use debugging strategies that you might normally use when you know normally working on code, which you wouldn't quite you know really get with the, the whiteboard. Now, the last format that you might see, um, and in fact, you strongly might see, because I know you're gonna do one of these for the mock interviews, uh, is a take-home exercise. Um, and I really love these. I think these are great um, because I think that they kind of do a better job of capturing um, like the natural state where most people um, do their work and, and really are able to you know, be successful, I think. Um, so these look like giving a larger scope problem or project, typically. Um, you're not gonna see, like no one's gonna give you fizz buzz and give you a whole weekend to work on it, right? It's gonna be more like, um, you know, build this application that can accept um, requests at this endpoint and validate those requests. or you know, something kind of more um, end to end like that. Um, usually it's time boxed to like maybe a single evening or a weekend, something like that. Um, and for these kinds of exercises, uh, usually you've got a little bit more leeway in terms of using frameworks or libraries. Um, like if someone asks you to implement a sorting algorithm and you just say like, okay, I, I call the sort method, like that's not really gonna work um, usually in like a, uh, a whiteboard kind of problem. Um, but for a take home exercise, um, you really have a little bit more free reign when it comes to um, pulling in third party code, uh, as long as it's reasonable and you have good, um, good reasoning for why it is that you chose the things that you chose and kind of maybe talk through some of the um, pros and cons of, of the third party code that you're using. Um, now, another important tip with the take home exercises is it's really important to take notes and to explain your thought process as you're coding along. Um, so you're not going to have the benefit of another human being there side by side, able to listen to you as you speak out loud and work through the problem. So instead, take that stuff that you would normally be um, asking or uh, making a note of and just actually physically make like a markdown or a text file or something in the repo that you're working on um, so that that's going to be there for the interviewers to look at later. Um, and also maybe like as notes for yourself to talk through whenever you actually sit down at the interview to discuss the solution to your problem. So what are these companies looking for uh, whenever they do this? Um, one of the primary things that they're looking for is, you know, your coding aptitude. They want to actually, you know, see if you're able to solve the problem or at least come close to solving the problem, right? Like they want to make sure that you know how to program and that you can take in a novel problem and break it down and uh, make it, you know, approachable. Um, a lot of times companies are also looking for what is called your, your code reach, which is sort of like how much code can you hold in your head at once, um, you know, the bigger, more complex of a problem, um, the more that you're gonna have to think about at one time, and the more that you can kind of keep in your working memory at once um, is gonna reflect positively on you. They're also really looking for uh, strong communication skills. So asking questions about the prompt and thinking out loud, um, you know, brainstorming out loud, those things are all gonna be uh, definitely a, a plus for you in terms of uh, how you're, you know, um, how you're appearing to these companies in these interviews. And also your code clarity uh, is gonna be another thing that these interviewers are looking at. So using things like descriptive variable names, uh, having solutions that are readable, uh, using comments where appropriate in order to clarify confusing logic, you know, things like that are also gonna go a long ways to really elevate um, the quality of your code. And lastly, uh, your interviewers are also going to be kind of checking out your vibe, basically. Um, you know, interviews are both uh, technical, but they're also behavioral. So, um, you know, you really want to project uh, good teammate energy, basically, and just really bring a positive attitude 
um, and try to come with, you know, a spirit of curiosity and openness. Um, and, you know, don't worry, it's expected that you're going to be a little bit nervous. Um, it's kind of nerve wracking to code in front of someone else under a time limit um, in this really sort of artificial environment. And your the people who are interviewing you have been through it before too, right? Like they also had to go through interviews like this and they're gonna understand. Um, so, you know, it's okay if you're a little bit nervous, but again, just try to be um, open and just kind of maintain a, a positive attitude and it'll really uh, serve you well in the interviews. Um, now you're probably saying, but Chris, this sounds really, really hard <laughs> and it's fine. It, it totally is hard, um, but you know, in the end, you're gonna be okay and you're gonna find a great job for real. Um, but the most important thing is that practice makes perfect and the technical coding challenges are in a lot of ways, a numbers game. Um, sometimes you can just draw a blank and you know just have a total brain fart uh, in the middle of an interview. And sometimes that's actually fine. I've, I've talked to engineers before who have told me about how yet like, they totally blew this one technical interview as part of their uh, interview process, but because they were able to talk through it and explain it well, and because they performed well in other interviews, um, they were actually able to get the job. Um, but you know what? Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes you just, <laughs> sometimes it, it just wasn't the right fit, um, and it just wasn't the right question for you, or it was a it was a gap in your knowledge, um, and it's and you just got to kind of keep keep moving and find that next company, um, and kind of keep rolling the dice until you find the right um, combination of factors that lead to success. Um, so, you know, just try your best and just relax and try to have fun with it, be yourself. Um, and remember that the most important skill is honestly determination. Uh, that I believe truly is more important than your technical skill. So not giving up, continuing to stick with it, practicing, doing mock interviews, doing online code challenges. If you stick with it, you are eventually going to succeed. So let's chat real quick about what a typical interview schedule would look like. Um, now this does vary by company, but this is kind of generally the format that you might expect from most companies. Most of the time it's gonna start off with a recruiter phone screen. Um, this is just gonna take the form of like a 15 minute phone call to just kind of check real quick, like what are, what are you looking for? You know, how much experience do you have? Are you familiar with the core technologies that they're kind of looking for on their checklist? You know, that kind of stuff. And as long as you're all, you know, thumbs up from that phone screen, uh, typically you'll move on to a second day, which might consist of a 30 to 60 minute technical one on one interview, or maybe they'll start off with like a manager or teammate behavioral interview. Um, so you might see one or the other first. Um, you might have another follow up, uh, likely kind of flip flopping whichever one you did. If you already had a technical, you might do it like a behavioral before they decide to call you in finally for day four, which is the on site. Um, now, again, you know, this is kind of how things worked for non remote companies and companies, you know, before the pandemic, um, people would actually physically like fly you in do on sites. Obviously, that's probably not been so feasible lately. Who knows what the future looks like? Maybe people will eventually start getting back to these. But right now, this is probably more so going to be remote. Um, but what the important thing is, is that it's going to be um, a big block of like multiple interviews throughout a day. So this is usually going to take like maybe half a day to all day. Um, and this is going to probably involve uh, multiple technical interviews. Um, you might also have some technical panel interviews where you are not only solving a coding challenge uh, in an interview format, but there might actually be like multiple people there who are all, uh, who are all judging you and, and um, assessing you for the interview. Um, and another uh, format of interview that you might see is like a, a system design uh, interview, maybe with like a director or like a, a higher level leader or something like that, um, CTO, just kind of depending on the size of the company. But yeah, by the end of day four, um, once you've made it through all of those technical panels and, and all of that stuff, then um, you know soon after you should be hearing back about whether you've got an offer or not. And you might, of course, hear not at any point in the process, right? But this is, you know, assuming that you do make it all the way through. So, uh, so let's talk about making the best possible impression at these interviews. Um, so a few tips here, especially kind of um, relevant to remote work. Um, so you know, be mindful of the space that you're doing your interviews in. So make sure that you've got uh, good lighting. 
Um, you know, you don't want like really strong lighting from directly behind you that's going to obscure your face and like, you know, put you in shadow. Um, and make sure that you've got just like a clean, like well presented background. Um, this is kind of basic stuff. Um, but, you know, just make sure that you don't have like dirty laundry laying around in your room or something whenever you're interviewing because that's not going to reflect so nicely. Um, and, you know, just like normal interviews, um, you know, even remotely, you want to make sure that you're still, you know, dressed like well dressed, maybe like business casual or whatever. It kind of depends on your own style, but just dress in something that you feel confident in. Honestly, that's like the most important thing. Um, and, you know, you also want to make sure that you're, you're not wearing like pajama pants or something so that if you have to stand up during the interview, you know, you might get embarrassed. Just, just make sure you've thought about that. Um, another good tip, make sure your computer's fully charged before you do the interview. Uh, if it dies on you in the middle of it, that's just going to be a real bummer. Um, Another big tip is uh, to wear headphones. Um, wearing headphones during the interview is gonna help you to hear the interviewers better. It's gonna help with communication and um, you, don't, you don't wanna have to be fighting um, the technology in order to even try to be successful communicating during the interview. Um, also remind uh, people that you're around that you're interviewing. So like your family or other people that you live with, um, just let them know that you're interviewing so that they can be respectful of your time and you know avoid interruptions. Um, and likewise, Avoid other distractions by making sure that your phone is muted or you know, being on do not disturb mode on your computer or whatever it is that you need to filter out those external distractions and really be successful. Um, and then last tip here is if you're doing an interview with a company that does give you a link to like a coder pad or something like that, make sure to test it out in advance. Make sure you can follow that link, that you don't get any errors, anything like that. Um, and if you do make sure to, to sync up with the recruiter or whoever beforehand to get that ironed out, um, that's just going to reflect well on you because it's going to show that you're demonstrating initiative. Um, and it's also just good to get that out of the way if there are going to be technical problems before the interview so that you can dedicate all of your time to being awesome. Okay, so let's finally get into the real details on how to rock the technical interview. So there's a few key uh, steps that we're going to break down. Um, and because we're programmers, we're going to start with an index of zero. Uh, Step zero is to understand the format of the question. Then we're really gonna understand the question itself. We're gonna brainstorm ideas as to how we might solve the question. We're gonna write out some pseudocode to help guide our solution. And then we're gonna actually write the solution itself. And then finally, we're gonna test out the solution. So step zero is just understanding how these interviews uh, work and understanding the format itself. So, most of the time, what you're going to see is that a company is going to ask you to solve one to three questions, maybe per technical interview. Um, and the following tips are assuming that this is the kind of interview that you're going to have. And in these interviews, the interviews usually want you to uh, want to see how you think in these kinds of interviews. Um, and it's fine if you, uh, you know, might take like all of the, uh, the hour on one particular problem and you don't get to the others. That's fine, too. Um, the, I, you know, frequently that can happen. Um, but some companies, on the other hand, like LinkedIn is a really good example of this, um, might actually go for more of a quantity over quality approach where they have you solve a lot of small coding problems instead. Um, but usually if that's going to be the kind of um, coding challenge, the interviewers will flag this before the interview starts and tell you to work quickly and that you're really trying to get through as many as you possibly can. Um, feel free to ask them, you know, how many interviews, uh, uh, how many questions will be in the interview. And in a rapid fire kind of format like this, uh, just keep in mind that your time matters. So try to spend less time kind of showing the interviewer how you think and more time writing out the code in this particular style of interview. Um, but that's really kind of a caveat. Like I said, most of the time, the standard format is gonna be like one to three questions uh, in a sit down. Okay, so we're in the interview, we've got our question, it's time to understand it. So before getting down to writing any code, uh, definitely start off by asking some clarifying questions about the question itself. Um, a lot of employers really are honestly looking for you to do this before you dive into the solution itself, um, because it's going to demonstrate that you are thoughtful and that you are, uh, you know, really applying a uh, scientific breakdown and thought process to the question. Um, and sometimes interviewers actually have additional information or context about the question that they don't reveal at first, and that you're, they're only going to bring up once you actually ask about it. So um, it's definitely gonna be expected for you to clarify these questions, um, which is kind of just like in the real world, right? Like in a business, you also are always kind of clarifying like what your tasks are. So it's, it's really kind of a model of that process as well. 
Uh, a really good thing to dig into with that would be to, for example, ask the interviewer for example input and output uh, if they didn't provide any already. So, you know, if they say that you're going to be given like a list of strings, maybe like ask them for an example of some real strings that the program would receive. Um, and if they do provide examples, uh, another thing that can help demonstrate your knowledge or uh, flush out if you are misunderstanding something is to suggest your own input and output uh, to the problem as well. So this can help to verify your understanding and also help you to kind of figure out what some of those edge cases are, um, which are also great to ask about. So, you know, asking about things like, um, you know, if you're going to be receiving an integer, like, can the integer be negative? Or if you're receiving a list of things, could the list be empty? Or could there be gaps in the list? You know, um, asking questions like that will help you to um, understand the, the shape and the parameters of the data coming into the problem. Uh, relatedly, another good thing to ask about is error handling. Um, so, you know, if there are conditions that can cause an exception in the program, um, definitely asking what the appropriate behavior is there, if you need to handle those exceptions, if you need to throw them yourself, um, and asking about how uh, to surface the messaging around error handling, or as it also relates to sometimes um, validation. So all of those questions will help you to get a keen understanding of the question itself and make sure that you and the interviewer are on the same page and demonstrate that you are you know, thinking the right things, asking the right questions and digging into the real um, key to the problem. So let's talk about an example question to kind of make this a little more concrete. An example question might be, given a list of numbers, add a target or and a target number k, return whether any two numbers in your list add up to k. So given a question like that, some follow-up questions that we might ask. Can the number be repeated? For example, uh, in this list, like one, five, and two, can I take two and repeat it twice to add up to four? Another good question would be, will the input list be sorted? or will it not be sorted? Um, that's honestly a good question to ask for almost any list-based question. Another question to dig into is whether the space or the running time is more important. This is one of the key trade-offs that we have to make whenever we're designing our algorithms and asking, you know, is it more important for the program to run quickly or is it more important for the space utilization of the program, the memory utilization to be lower? Um, in the real world, sometimes those parameters matter and sometimes algorithms are gonna be more bound by memory versus bound by you know, network IO or things like that. And also asking uh, what the output should be. So the problem doesn't really make it clear, right? Um, so asking some questions around how that should be outputted, like should it just be true or false if a match can be found or should it be the numbers that are adding up to the target, the indexes of the numbers, et cetera. Um, usually the interviewer will have like an idea of what this should be, or if it doesn't matter, they'll just tell you that it doesn't matter and you can just like make a decision and just kind of move on. Okay, so now that we've got our problem, it's time to do some brainstorming on how to solve it. Now remember, an inefficient solution is still a solution. So sometimes it's okay to just start with the brute force answer um, and then refine it and optimize it later. Um, if you're able to deliver a working solution and you know maybe it's not the most efficient solution, but you can point out what is inefficient about it and what you might go about improving later, um, that can be a totally valid um, and, and reasonable way to answer these questions. Again, think about the trade-offs between space and runtime and be able to articulate uh, which solutions uh, use you know, more space or use more runtime and be able to articulate, excuse me, be able to articulate the differences between them in runtime. Uh, you might be asked about the complexity or the big O notation of your solution, and you should definitely be ready to discuss this. Um, I'm not going to like go into a tutorial on big O notation in this uh, talk, but for those of you for whom this is review, uh, this is just like a good reminder to brush up on big O. Um, and if it's a concept that you haven't touched on yet, um, I'd recommend after this, maybe, you know, watching a YouTube video or something um, just to become familiar with the terminology. Um, but to give a really, really, really basic example, big O is basically how long does your program take to run based on 
the input to the program. So like if your program just loops over a list once and the list is length of n, the big O time of that would be O of n. But if your program has to loop through the list and then at every iteration of the loop, let's say that it also loops again with like a nested for loop, that is gonna be O of n squared because you're looping through not just through uh, n times, but n times n times. Really basic example. Um, so encourage you to, to look more into that um, because you'll definitely have questions about this. Um, and your interviewer is going to, um, it, it's gonna be kind of a, a common language for you to discuss with your interviewer about your solution and about the trade-offs that it has versus other solutions potentially. Um, on the right here, I've got like a picture of a bunch of different sorting algorithms and what their time complexity is. Um, keep in mind that your time complexity also can be different in the best versus the worst case versus the average case. Um, so some algorithms are better um, like in general and some are better like not, uh, not having a, a uh, as bad of a worst case scenario. Um, and those are also trade-offs that you can think through and discuss. But most importantly, throughout the whole brainstorming process, make sure to think out loud. Um, whenever you're coming up with an idea, you know, even if it's not the right idea, don't be afraid to just kind of blurt it out and um, uh, communicate what it is that you're thinking and what your ideas are. Um, even even um, the ones that you, you don't end up using, you know, that's, that's fine too, because that's all data, that's all information for the interviewer to take in about your thought process. So once you've brainstormed a few ideas and you've decided on the one that you want to try implementing, go ahead and begin writing out some pseudocode. Uh, usually this could take the form of some comments. Um, so like on the right, we have a really basic example of like starting the program, entering two numbers A and B, adding the numbers together, et cetera. Um, you've probably seen pseudocode, so you probably get the idea. Um, once you've uh, written out the pseudocode and comments and come up with a plan to tackle the problem, uh, then it's time to actually begin writing the solution. Again, keep talking, uh, keep the communication lines going, uh, even while you're coding, and uh, just kind of narrate what it is that you're doing. Um, like as you're writing out a for loop, you know, be like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a loop that's gonna iterate over the items of the list from this to this, um, et cetera, and kind of like. Um, you know, code out loud, as it were. Um, almost think about it like if you're doing um, paired programming with the interviewer, right? Um, if that's something that, that you're familiar with. Uh, the interviewers want to make sure also that you understand how your solution works. So uh, being able to articulate what it's doing um, is going to help them to understand your understanding of it, which is really what they're trying to get at. So sort of narrating that as you're going along, it's going to help them to get into your brain basically. And they also want to see you make decisions about how to handle the problem. So um, as you're writing the code out, you know, being uh, ar articulating the trade-offs as you encounter them, like, for example, like I could create a hash map here to start storing the values of this calculation. And that is going to take up additional memory because of the utilization of the, the hash map, you know, things like that. Uh, try to talk out loud about that as much as you can. So to make this a concrete thing again, let's uh, go through some possible solutions to the example problem that we gave earlier. Uh, there's two different solutions here, and these are both written out in JavaScript. So hopefully a language that most of you can be familiar with. So the solution on the left takes an approach by beginning with the number list and actually sorting it so that the numbers are all returned in order. And then we create uh, two counter variables, i and j, and basically they start at the beginning and the end of the uh, list. And then while i is less than j, we iterate through the list. So we look at basically for starters, the first item and the last item, add them together and see if it's equal to the target. And if it is, we just return those indexes. And if it's not, then we check if the value is less than the target or if it's greater than the target. So if it's greater than the target, uh, then we decrement J because they're sorted. So by decrementing J, we know that the next value, uh, 
that is accessed by index J is going to be smaller. Um, vice versa, if it is actually smaller than the target, we know that we need to get a bigger number. So then we increment I because I was at the beginning. So by bumping it up, the next number that we get should be bigger. And then we keep uh, iterating through bumping these counters until we get to a point where we find the solution or we don't find any solution and we return an empty array. Now, another example of how you can solve this problem is seen on the right. This approach instead uses a hash map. So we create a new map and then we iterate through the list. And every time we iterate, we check if there has, uh, if, if the seen map has a particular value. So the value that we're checking is we actually take the target number and then subtract the current number that we're looking at. Um, so like that value is gonna be representative of the number that would be required to add to that number to equal the target. So if we have seen such a number, then we know that that number plus the current number that we're at is the answer. And then we return those uh, array indexes. But if we haven't seen a number yet that would add up to the target with that number, then we will set the value in the hash map. So then on the next iteration, that value is now present in the map. And so we, so we build up this map containing the different values. And if at any point we hit a number where a value can be pulled that'll add up to uh, the target number, we return that. And if we never find it, then again, we return an empty array. So these are two totally valid uh, approaches to solving the problem. Uh, they both work, but they've got some differences, right? So the left one ends up taking a little bit longer, I think, because we have to start by sorting the array and then we iterate through it. Whereas the other one uh, doesn't need the sorting step. However, this one uses a little bit more uh, space because it has to create that map in order to use as a secondary data structure to keep track of those uh, those values that it's seen to execute the algorithm. So being able to articulate, you know, the simple trade-offs of uh, the differences between algorithms is going to help uh, your interviewers to show that, you know, you really understand the problem and you understand the uh, pros and cons of the approaches that you're taking. So you've coded up your solution and uh, maybe you love it, maybe it's great, maybe you don't, maybe it's just kind of okay, but hey, it works. Um, the next step is to test it out. So at this point, what you should be able to do is take some of the examples that your interviewer provided and basically run them through your code to see if it works. Um, coming up with some new test cases is also a good idea at this point because maybe your code actually works like great with even numbers, but fails with odd numbers or you know something like that. Uh, it can help you to, to flush out those, those edge cases that you might've missed in your initial solution. Um, try to think of likely errors that you might've made too while you're going through this process. Um, some things to check out are like your Boolean comparators um, or incrementing, you know, I, I'm sure you can all think of how often you've had like an off by one error in your code or something like that. Um, also be aware of uh, type issues too, um, and make sure that, uh, you know, you're always, adding the correct uh, types together or, and uh, that your casting is being done properly, things like that. So uh, let's look at an example of how you might actually walk through testing your code, um, especially if you're in an environment where you don't actually have the ability to run the code directly in like an IDE or something like that. So uh, a nice way to do this is on each line to just write out in a comment what the values are of those particular um, you know, variables. Um, and in this notation here, uh, the comma is gonna represent the second iteration, okay? So the first time around, the map just starts off as an empty object here, okay? And then we start iterating. So at the first index, right? So where num is gonna equal two, um, we check to see if uh, the target minus two so nine minus two is seven. Does that exist in the map yet? Uh, nope, it doesn't because it's empty. So we know this is gonna be false. Um, so then we go into our else block and we set in the map 
uh, nums at i, which is that value of two. So now the map is going to look like this. So then we iterate again. And on the second iteration, uh, nums at i is now going to be equal to seven. So when we subtract uh, seven from the target, which is nine, we get two. And on our last iteration, we stored two in the hash map. OK, so this time when we do the get, it's going to return true. So then we go into this return block, and boom, we return the indexes 0, 1. So that's an example of how you might um, you know, just use your brain as the human computer, essentially, to just walk through the steps one by one and test out that the algorithm is working or not. Another option that you can use in order to visualize this is by using a table. Um, I actually find that tables are really useful when it comes to uh, truth tables. So if you have uh, like a complicated series of uh, Boolean parameters and you need to sort of model out like, okay, if this one's true and this one is true, but this one's false, then it should look like this. And then kind of being able to break each of those out at a, at a layer by layer in a table um, can help you to think through that. Um, for this example, like you can, you can kind of make it work, but it's, I think it's actually just kind of more helpful to do it um, on each line in the comments. But this is another example of how you could uh, write out the output for this program. All right, and then the last step, once you've uh, tested it out, um, if you have the ability to, is to run your code. Um, when you run your code, uh, you of course, you know, have access to the same debugging utilities that you might whenever you are doing normal development. So using things like uh, console logs and debuggers can help you to figure out um, if your code is doing the right thing and debug some of those issues uh, if you are running into unexpected trouble. Okay, we've done it. We've talked about the technical interview. Uh, that's a load off, right? But let's talk about the behavioral interview that also occurs at the same time as the technical interview. So remember, you're being evaluated on how you can respond to problems under pressure. And that's gonna be something that you're gonna have to do in the real workspace too, right? Like, even though interview coding interviews are kind of contrived and artificial, uh, they still sort of model something which you're gonna have to do in the day to day, which is uh, you're gonna have to solve new and novel problems. Um, instead of some random interviewer giving it to you though, it's gonna be your product manager who's like, hey, I need you to fix this problem, right? Um, and there's going to be deadlines, right? Like there's going to be um, trade-offs that you're going to have to make around which solutions that you're going to decide on. So um, these are all, you know, skills and behaviors that they want to see you modeling in the interview the same way that you would approach those problems in the workspace. So some things that you can do to be successful with that are always being curious about the problem, uh, trying to understand at a deeper level, you know, what's going on, asking uh, the whys, asking the hows, right? And being open, um, being an open communicator and asking just lots of questions. And during these interviews, uh, it's okay if you need to Google something or if you need to ask the interviewers for help or ask them for clarification. Um, if you're stuck on something specific, uh, just tell the interviewer, that's totally fine. Um, you know, we live in a, in a modern age where probably every single programmer out there has to look stuff up on the internet with regular frequency, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's going to be normal and expected. So don't, don't feel like you have to kind of like lock up around that kind of stuff. Just, just be open and be yourself. Um, and that's, that's really all that you, that you have to worry about, I think. A few more tips on the behavioral interview. Um, so, uh, let me back up. So um, th those were some tips on the behavioral aspects of the coding interview itself. You're also likely going to have behavioral interviews with like managers, teammates, directors, etc. cetera. Um, so some tips to help you prefer, uh, prepare for those interviews. Um, it's great to go through and prepare a list of scenarios or conflicts or difficult situations that you've dealt with in your past. Um, having those things be on the top of your mind is going to give you uh, examples to draw on whenever people ask you uh, these behavioral kinds of questions. Um, a great uh, place to look at for ideas is this Amazon leadership principle questions. Um, I'm going to follow this link actually real quick. So um, the Amazon leadership principles are these 14 fundamental values 
Um, a lot of other companies out there have really like similar value statements. Um, and this is actually something I recommend that you research whenever you apply for a company is like, go look at what their values are, um, you know, find them and try to think about ways that you have demonstrated those values or that you can relate those values to your own experiences. Um, so within this uh, document that I've got linked in the slides, um, and we'll link the slides later, so, so don't worry about writing this URL down. Um, they give different examples of questions that you can ask to sort of get at these values. Um, so these are really great examples of questions that you might see um, out there in the wild, especially if you apply for a job at Amazon. But these kind of questions are going to come up a lot in other places like, uh, you know, tell me about a time when you didn't meet customer expectations. What happened and how did you deal with the situation? You know, or um, tell me about an important lesson you learned over the past year, et cetera. Um, if you can think of things like that in your own life and in your own career, in your own experiences that you can draw on in the interview, um, it's gonna really help you to be prepared and not just kind of like draw a blank whenever those things come up. When you're uh, answering those questions and explaining those situations, a nice way to approach it is the STAR method. Uh, this is an acronym meaning situation, task, action, and result. Um, and I'll actually jump to the next slide here because we've got a nice little diagram of that. Um, so whenever you're answering these, uh, you can use this acronym to sort of frame the way that you respond to the question. So start off by setting the scene and explaining the context of, you know, what was happening. Like, um, my team had to hit this deadline for this project and we were running into problems because of the database migration or something like that, right? Um, then talk about the particular task it is that you were assigned. So, you know, what was the purpose of the thing that you were trying to fix or what was the uh, problem for the customer that you were trying to solve, something like that. Uh, then give a concrete action of what it was that you did. Like maybe I implemented a new script to automate the database migration process or uh, you know, maybe I built out a new customer help portal page to uh, you know, I, uh, help customers identify uh, helpful articles for them or something like that. And then finally, out, uh, put, uh, lay out the results or the outcome that you had as a result of the action. Um, the best kind of results I think that you can share with interviewers are if you have some kind of like hard data on like, yeah, I was able to, you know, speed up our team's CI pipeline by 50%, or we were able to increase conversion to the sign up page by 10% or something like that. Um, but even if you don't have hard and fast numbers, um, just kind of giving the overall impact um, and relating that impact back to the business and the customers and the efficiency of your team um, is really going to help to clearly spell out a situation and show your interviewer like how you were awesome, basically, is the goal, right? Um, some more example behavioral interview questions, um, and these might have a little bit more to do with uh, code, would be like uh, troubleshooting. So I've seen this one a lot where someone might give you kind of like an example problem that was happening. Like, okay, users are seeing 504 gateway timeouts across the website. Uh, you know, what would you do? Like, where would you start to look? Um, and, you know, if I was in that situation, you know, I'd probably talk about like, okay, I'd start to look at, you know, our dashboards and metrics for the web server and, you know, like, is that looking all right? And I might start to look into the logs and start searching for errors, like are error rates elevated, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So talking through like how you might debug a problem. Um, another really common one you'll see in these interview formats will be like um, explaining a particular technical concept. So like explain how does React work to me? Like how does the virtual DOM work? Um, or, you know, explain it like I'm five uh, to how do, how do you use CS Grid? You know, something like that, right? Um, and then, yeah, I think these, these are a bit overlapping with the Amazon ones, but, uh, you know, there's always the, the tell me about a time when you did blank, um, like solving a conflict with a colleague or had urgent competing priorities um, or had to learn something new. Um, and it's fine if these even just come from your personal life. Like, uh, I know a lot of you are going to be um, at, a, at a fairly early point in your technical careers. So, you know, feel free to draw on prior job experience, uh, if you've got that, or draw on experiences with your family or your friends, you know, th those are all uh, parts of your life as well, and they can potentially be relevant. 
Okay, um, so the last thing to keep in mind here is, remember, you're also interviewing the company just as much as they're interviewing you. So be prepared to ask them things about the company. Uh, come with a list of questions prepared at the end of the interview. So um, you can drill into the things that you care about in the workplace that you're trying to find, right? Um, here's just like a big old laundry list of potential example questions. Um, so things like asking about uh, attending conferences or continuing education budgets, um, asking about, you know, hours worked, work-life balance, vacation time, you know, um, all of those kind of things are really a great way to dig into, um, you know, what, it's, what is it really like to work there, what the culture is like, um, and get an expectation of how you're going to be treated as an employee there. Um, because not every company that you're going to work at or that you're going to interview at um, is going to be stellar, right? It's going to also be up to you to be a good judge of where do you actually want to end up spending your time and your effort and energy, right? Okay, um, a couple more resources to here for you. Uh, here are some interview coding question practice websites um, like Geeks for Geeks, Lead Code, or Hacker Rank. Um, if you wanna get out there and do some mock interview questions and start to grapple with some of these uh, problems on your own, those would be really great websites to get practice from. Uh, so highly recommend that. Um, a book that I would also recommend grabbing, um, if you wanna buy it, you don't have to, you know, a lot of this information is uh, available for free out there, but uh, Cracking the Coding Interview by Gail Ackman McDowell. Um, it's kind of like the classic uh, code interview question book. Um, I read at least part of it uh, back uh, whenever I was first interviewing. Um, it's really good. It's gonna help you to uh, get exposure to a lot of these questions and algorithms, um, talk about big O notation, um, all that good stuff. Um, this is going to be especially important too, if you really want to shoot for that like highest tier of company, like those FANG companies, um, then this, this book is going to be uh, a lifesaver for you. So definitely check that out. Okay, and that's basically a wrap. So uh, get out there, get interviewing, you're going to do great. Um, it's going to be tough, but you're going to practice and you're gonna learn and you're gonna get experience. You're gonna get a mock interview in here. That's gonna go great. And uh, you know, just know that it's gonna be hard, but if you keep trying, you're gonna have success and I believe in you. Um, so that's my, that's my presentation slash pep talk. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, and now let's get into questions. You got them. Dude, thanks for all of that amazing information, Chris. And thank you for believing in us. I'm, I'm very appreciative. <laughs> Um, this is like the technical interview is so intimidating for me, probably for everybody else. This is a brilliant time to ask questions to somebody who knows technical interviewing very well. So what questions do you have? Be open and transparent. We're all scared here. I'll go. Sure, go. Um, I've had three technicals so far and two out of three, I completely blanked, just choked in the nerves. What do you do to come back from that? I mean, I know talking out loud, pseudocoding, whatever, but like literally, what do you do in your head to move forward and get the brain switched back on? <laughs> Good question. Um, a few tips that I can share. So our, our bodies uh, did not evolve to solve coding questions. They solve to like run away from lions and things like that, right? So we have this really annoying fight or flight uh, reflex. And when that gets uh, triggered during an interview, that is not gonna be helpful for you. It's not gonna help you to uh, survive because running away from the interviewer probably is not what you really need to do in that moment. Um, so you have to figure out how to um, bring yourself back down, I think. so. I really recommend like um, deep breathing exercises or other kinds of like rooting exercises that you can do to bring yourself back into the physical moment and de-escalate the stress that's going on in your body. So sometimes just like telling the interviewer like, hey, I'm just gonna take a couple of seconds to just, just breathe and think through this is totally fine. Um, I know I said a lot about like, you know, be talking, be communicating during the interview, but it's also okay if you need to just like take a moment and take a breather to take a step back. Um, I think sometimes another thing that can be helpful in that situation is, um, you can, you can kind of like get tunnel vision and kind of like, 
like block yourself in on a particular thing that maybe you're like not getting or not understanding about the, the question. So sometimes like taking a complete step back and almost like forgetting what you were just thinking about and then like re-engaging with the problem um, and maybe trying to like engage with other parts of it um, can help you to kind of, I think, like unblock that, if that makes sense. But I have a also my, my last piece of advice there is, yeah, sometimes you are just going to blank and it's just going to be like, all right, dang, that, that one wasn't it. Let's keep going, you know, so. That's kind of what I was going to ask because Shelly, I've totally been there too, where I just like, I could not go on and I just wanted to hang up and be like, well, that's washed. So it's like, what are some things, and this can be like a brainstorm or whatever from anybody that we can say when we're genuinely just like, it is not going to come to me. I am, I just can't, I, that's the end of this. Like, can you ask for help? Can you be like, can I get a clue? Would you work through something with me or should we just move on? Like, what are some phrases that could be okay for getting you out of that? Yeah, the way that I like to think about it is the interview is a simulation of being on the job. And if on the job, I'm utterly stumped, I'm going to ask for help, right? Like, I'm going to reach out and find someone who knows better than me. And I'm going to um, do, do what I need to do to get over that. I'm not just going to, like, shut down and be like, well, I guess I need to quit my job because I don't know how to do this thing, right? <laughs> Um, so, you know, I'll just tell the interviewers, like, I'll be like, I'm stumped. I don't, I don't get it. Here's, here's what I'm stumped on. Here's what I don't get. And like, mm. try to articulate that. And then frequently the interviewer will, um, maybe give you like a hint or help give you like, um, like they might tell you to like, think about this part of the problem or something like that. Um, another thing that's kind of common too, that I'll see is an interviewer might, um, simplify the problem if you're struggling with it, right? So they might tell you like, okay, let's just say, assume that the input is going to be sorted or something like that. You know, like they might give you a little bit of um, a foot in the door that might make the problem slightly like um, mm -hmm. more tractable. And then once you've like come to a solution with that, um, uh, with that like, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for with that, um, with it easier, right? Then you can talk about, okay, now maybe here's how I would approach it without that uh, that stepping stone, right? Okay, so I do, I love the idea of being like, just admitting like, oh, I'm totally stumped on this. Here's what I'm stumped on. Like, and be very specific and maybe find a question to ask can kind of get the conversation going. And yeah. I just feel like what happened to me, I was like, they're just staring at me. They're staring at me and I can't break out of this. This is very uncomfortable. <laughs> so I love that. That's a great tip. Are there thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, fears, and anxieties? I have when? a question. D. Um, <laughs> hey, Chris. Uh, so I'm wondering what is okay to ask before the interview happens? Like, you know, you know, it's been scheduled and you're responding. Is it considered okay to say, hey, if there's anything you recommend I review in preparation for this, please let me know? Or does that seem like it's fishing for hints or you know, just wondering what we can ask beforehand, if anything. My thought process is f fish for as many hints as you want. Like that's all just you getting more information and you setting yourself up for more success. It's not like they'll be like, oh, penalty. You ask too many questions, you're out, you know, like, so just ask. Um, I thought the, the question that you asked right there was perfect of like, hey, just what should I know? Is there anything that, that you want me to review? Because that's super open-ended. And so that gives them a lot of space to potentially be like, oh yeah, review X, Y, and Z. Um, some of like the, the sort of baseline stuff that I might ask beforehand too is gonna be like, like what language will it be in? Like, that's a really basic one. Like, will it, will it be in a language that I use in my day-to-day -day, like JavaScript or do I need to brush up on like my Python or something like that? Like, that's a really good basic one. Um, but also asking, you know, like, is it going to be more of like an algorithmic or data structure question, or is it going to be more of like a hands-on sort of like build this API or build this UI, you know, something like that. I think that's another really good, just basic framing question that probably most people are going to be comfortable giving you a little bit of a, of a hint on. So. Cool. Thank you. Other ones, other questions. I had a question. Rafa, um, Rafa. Rafa. Uh, it's kind of tailored towards more so like take home assignments. Um, like when I'm demoing code that I've already written, like I tend to struggle with knowing exactly how much information to give. Um, so I was wondering if you had any advice on like how thorough we should be when discussing what we've done. That's a really good question. Um, something that I'll think about in the moment is like, 
my current time allocation. You know, like if I've got like an hour with the interviewer, um, I might ask them like how, like how much of the interview do you want me to kind of spend going through the question? Um, and if they're, if they're just like, oh, just give me like a real quick overview because I already read it all and I've already got questions for you. Like that's sort of one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum might be like, oh yeah, take the first 30 minutes to give me like a real deep dive, you know, like, so they might kind of give you what they want to look for. Um, but then I'd say as you're going along, um, probably kind of just use your best judgment on what things were more interesting to you about solving the problem versus something that's kind of just like basic boilerplate that you kind of might do for like any problem, if, if that makes sense. Like, like let's say that you create a, a Create React app just to kind of like get the UI up and running. Um, maybe don't like dive deep on the architecture of Create React app. You can just kind of assume like they probably just know what that is and how that works. So let's dig into like, here's the actual kind of things that I added to it and like the interesting pieces that, that I did, you know. That's really helpful. Thank you. Other questions? We've got about four minutes till the top of the hour. These are great questions. Yeah, y'all had a lot more questions than the last time, so this is great. <laughs> really good. After the interview, what should you do? I didn't interview. It, I went went through the problem. I was done in like 10 minutes when they budgeted 30 minutes. I thought it went pretty well, but it's been over a week and I haven't heard anything, but I'm really bad at following up because I get shy. Like what, who should I, should I reach back out to the interviews and just send them a note after? Should I reach back out to the recruiter? Like what should you do immediately after the interview? And then like maybe a little bit after the interview. Yeah, good question. Um, my answer is kind of twofold. I think the first thing that you should do after an interview is go treat yourself. Um, so <laughs> whatever that means for you, uh, go reward yourself because you just did something hard. Um, but as far as like follow-up goes, my personal rule is always, if it's been a week, then I need to reach out. Um, and I, I kind of follow that rule with a lot of things in life generally. Um, but yeah, like usually give them about a week. And if you still haven't heard back, just like a quick, you know, Hey message, um, you know, um, just to kind of keep, keep going in their ear. But yeah, unfortunately with the world of recruiting, like sometimes you're just never going to hear back or sometimes they'll like string you along like forever. And they'll tell you like six months later, like, Oh, sorry, we, we went with another candidate. Like it's so ridiculous. So, um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with just asking, but yeah, sometimes you are just going to get ghosted, which kind of sucks. One thing that I want to call out on there, just from like my experience at Zapier specifically is, um, yeah, I love to wait a week because things are just really chaotic. And so, for example, if Chris does your technical interview, he's got a couple of days to send in his notes about that interview. So because he also has a whole other job, not just interviewing, that can take a long time sometimes. Then once it gets into recruitment, they're also really busy doing all these other things. So a week is a good amount of time to expect them to take to get back to you. And then what I would also recommend is reaching out to the recruiter because it's their job to sort of manage that whole process. So again, going back to the Zapier example, Chris probably doesn't check his email inbox ever, like ever. And so it's more than likely just gonna get lost over there. Um, but if you ping the recruiter, they generally are really hungry to get you through the process so that they can either you know, send you an offer or check the box and be like, okay, well, that's off my plate now. So lean on recruiters because that's what they do. And the people who are technically interviewing you are probably like back to their regular job and doing other things. You'll probably get a better response from recruiters, but if the recruiter doesn't reach out, feel free to also just send messages to whoever else is involved because they owe you that they should, they should be following up with you. It's not unreasonable. Other questions? Okay, well, if you do have questions, as said before, and I will say it again, we are all here for you. If we don't know the answers, we will find somebody who does, or we'll just work together to brainstorm to come up with what we think could work best in your situation. So with that, we will wrap this session. The next things that will be happening are mock interviews. So if you haven't already got them scheduled, Get your mock interviews scheduled for this coming week. You'll be doing a job fit mock interview. So review those questions um, and pair up with your partner that is in GitHub uh, to go through those and just kind of talk them out and talk through your Collab Lab experiences specifically and sort of brainstorm how you can use those experiences to answer those questions because it's really relevant team experience, you know, working on a team of developers to solve problems. Um, 
the technical interview, likewise, there's a list of questions you should work through, but you'll also be finishing up your take home assignment if you haven't already and sending that to your technical interviewer so that they can review it before their interview with you. It is super important to do these technical mock interviews because you don't want the first time that you're saying these words out loud and doing these things out loud to be a time when an actual opportunity is on the line. So use them, ask your mentor questions afterwards and really debrief well about what, what could be improved or what went really well or you know what tips and tricks they might have for you too. Okay, with that, it will say goodbye. Keep in touch in Slack if you have questions about things and we will see you in the coming week for a variety of different things. Good. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thank Bye, friends. Good Ooh. to see you all. Bye, Bye y'all.